This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, and our brand new bosses, Errol, Ian, Kelly, and Thomas Love. They all just started backing us on Patreon. Welcome to you all. Coming up on DTNS, we unpack iOS versus Android and what really makes people switch. Might Amazon pay your cell phone bill in the future? And Ron Richards tells us why pinball machines are the new hot mess. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 2nd, 2023. From a studio that has yet to be named, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us is Ron Richards, CEO and co-founder of Scorbit, also host of All About Android and former colleague of many of us. Hi, Ron. Yes, hello. Hey, good to be back uh, after my eight-year hiatus from DTNS. I'm glad to be back. Uh <laughs> <laughs> ha, ha, has it been eight years? I was. We I did. Was, we did. Rich looked in the schedule. It was back in 2015. That it was last time I was on the show. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Good to be well, reunited. <laughs> well, uh, lovely to have you. We're <laughs> going to talk about pinball. We're going to talk about Android. We're going to talk about all the things. But first, we shall start with the quick hits. <laughs> Yet more shakeups at Twitter this week. The company's head of trust and safety, Ella Irwin, announced that she resigned from the company. She joined Twitter back in June of 2022, succeeding Royal uh, Yoel Roth in November of last year. No word on who is going to replace her in that role, but that is not all. The Wall Street Journal sources say A.J. Brown, Twitter's head of brand safety and ad quality, has also departed Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports Apple is in discussions to open, relocate, or remodel up to 53 Apple stores over the next four years. About 40% of those are planned for the Asia-Pacific region. Apple currently operates over 520 retail stores across 26 countries, so give you some sense of how big of a expansion and remodeling this uh, will be. WWDC starts on Monday, just a reminder, so we may hear more about that in what is sure to be a jammed, packed event. <laughs> Progress Software disclosed that it discovered a vulnerability in its Move It Transfer software, which manages file transfer software and could also allow for unauthorized access of the file environment. Several security firms, including Mandian, said they saw evidence of data exfiltration from multiple victims. It appears that malicious actors started scanning for the utility on March 3rd, and patches are now available. Microsoft updated the free version of Teams. This is the one that's included with Windows 11 specifically to support its communities feature. So this does things like let users create and manage focused groups. This was originally only available on mobile, although Microsoft now says they plan to bring it to Windows 10, Mac OS, and the web. Not too surprising to see that expansion, but now that we have confirmation, the version of Teams also added Microsoft designer integration, and this lets users create media assets, mainly you know, pictures and stuff for te from text prompts. Raspberry Pis have been in short supply for a while. <clears throat> Pardon me. And now it looks like there might be some relief on the way, perhaps. Raspberry Pi CEO Eben Upton said that the company expects to ramp production up of its products to 1 million per month in July, the goal being to maintain production until it clears the consumer backlog. This would be a significant output increase as the company shipped 800,000 units in all of Q1, quite a bit lower than what it would like to do, which Upton called the worst quarter since 2015. The company is working with Sony on this effort, and Sony began stockpiling non-silicon elements needed in pie production. All right, Rich, let's talk a little bit more about how Amazon wants to make Prime more prime. <laughs> yeah, it's a, some some prime real estate for Amazon, surely. Yeah, so, I mean, Amazon Prime, I, people might forget that at one point it just offered free two-day shipping, but, you know, over the years it's expanded to a lot of other services. I'm not going to lie, I had to look it up just to make sure I would even get, like, a, a, just a, a representative sample of this. Things like, you, you got to, you know, you got Twitch Prime on there, you got music, you got video streaming, you got ebooks, you got podcasts, even a Yuri Grubhub. There's so many stuff, it's surprising every time you look there. It's a lot. It's also pretty successful uh, with consumer intelligence partners or research partners estimating there are 167 million Prime subscribers in the U.S. as of March. A lot of people, 
but the research also found this was basically flat growth on the year. The number hadn't really moved all that much. Yeah, so you might be wondering, okay, how else would Amazon possibly sweeten the Prime deal if you're already a Prime member? Well, cheap mobile phone service seems to be on the market, maybe. Bloomberg sources say that Amazon is in talks with Verizon, T-Mobile, and Dish about offering discounted cell service at around $10 per month. It sounds like a great deal. Or possibly even free if you're a Prime subscriber. Any deal or service is reportedly months away. This is not happening tomorrow. But does Prime Mobile give Amazon a good lock-in feature? Ron, are you a Prime member? And if not, uh, would this make you sign up? Uh, I am a Prime member. I've been. A, I'm an OG Prime member. In fact, Sarah, I think I remember when Prime came out. I think we were all at Revision Three, <laughs> and I remember like the like everyone signing up for. It. I vaguely remember that. I could be wrong, but I remember when Prime. I was a. I, I was an original. Get free shipping. That's a great deal. Hundred whatever bucks a month, and have never looked back. Um, I do use Amazon Prime Video to watch stuff. Stuff like everybody mm -hmm, else does. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend. Oh, excuse me. I recommend The Outlaws. It's a great a British show on, on Amazon. But I don't use anything else. I don't use the music. I don't use the cloud storage. I don't use the photo storage. Um, I don't use you know, anything else. No, I don't else. either. Yeah. And I, I've had, I, as far I as, as, far as shipping, yeah. shipping I do. But I've yeah, a, I, otherwise. I have a friend who yeah. swears by the music service, loves it, says it's great. And like, and the cloud photo, and it's like, you're a fool for being on Google Photos. But I'm like, yeah, no, I have no desire to use it. So <laughs> I, I have no desire to have Amazon linked to my cell phone coverage, even at $10 a month, personally. I, I mean, that price, I don't know how they do it, right? Because they, I, I, either they would be partnering with, they would be, you know, uh, you know, Pri Prime Mobile from Dish or T-Mobile or something like that, or they would just be their own MVMO. And the idea that right now, like, it seems like the market rate that that all of these, you know, virtual uh, network operators are able to hit is about $25 a month. Like, that's what Visible is at. That's what uh, Mint has been at for a while there. That seems to be like the base level of like unlimited, you know, mobile and stuff like that. 25 is how they're able to make that feasible. So for Amazon to, to offer $10, either they're just not paying the carriers enough, which is not going to happen, or they're eating that cost, which would be more than the cost of Prime is right now, right? If we if we just take $15 over 12 months, it's like $180, right? Don't do not do my math. Just, just let me know I'm wrong. But like, so I don't know how they make that math work other than just making it a huge loss leader and being like, listen, once we get your phone number, it's enough of a pain in the butt to change your number. Uh, I think that's, that's going to, exactly that's going to make some key. stickiness there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think yeah. exactly. That's the thing. I mean, we're talking, Amazon is the company that gave you the subsidized tablet with ads on the load screen. Like they were the first people, one of the first people in the domestic market to do that. Right. So like, clearly they have no problem with doing that as a loss leader to get the customers. They just want acquisition. Cause once you get in on that, on that ecosystem, it is admittedly, it is hard to get off the train. Like I use, I, I, I actually have scheduled subscription subscribe things every six weeks amazon sends me more paper towels oh, and more iced tea and and so, yeah. yeah it's amazing it's, I, yeah i live yeah. my life that way yeah, yeah. so so well, i'm not surprised they do know, this but i would they wouldn't get my dollar for it so uh, well, gosh I, I don't know ron i i feel like i i'm already so entrenched i uh yeah. I, I i i don't I, I mean i'm a verizon user i don't know if uh <laughs> somebody would like to pick up my monthly cell phone bill, which is about $89. Um, but if they were to, and it was Amazon and I'm already paying them for, you know, dog bags every yeah. six weeks um, and variety of other things. I don't know. It's kind of compelling. I think that the company is banking on that. Well, my, my point of view on this, and I'm, I recognize my old man internet stoicism <laughs> in it. I, I, I am still with T-Mobile from when I signed up for, when I, I, I got Android, when the G1 came out. I'm still with T-Mobile. I have no contract. I'm on an unlimited unlimited everything deal that I got in 2008, and I refuse to speak to anyone at T-Mobile because I'm afraid to lose that unlimitedness. So I haven't touched it. I, I, you'd think I would sign up for Google Fi. I haven't. You'd think I'd try Mint Mobile. I haven't. 
I'm probably paying more than I need to, but I'm holding on to that unlimited data and all the stuff mm -hmm. for dear life yep. for like no, no reason. Like it, it's so I'm definitely, uh, well, it's the reason that you, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to have a, you know, worse deal yeah. later on. Right. Yeah. The, the one interesting thing about all of this is that this is basically flipping what the carriers are already doing, like the complete opposite way, right? Like when you sign up for Verizon, oh, you get free Apple TV or you get free streaming or whatever like this and stuff like that. This is Amazon saying like, no, 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 that's not the pack-in. Everything else is the thing you're paying for. The pack-in is going to be your mobile service is a really kind of a wild place to put, you know, based on how much of a premium all of the, obviously all these carriers, uh, you know, that's their bread and butter. So that just shows you the presence that Amazon has. And if you're dish and trying to grow subscribers on a fledgling network, Amazon, 167 million people, you know, even if you get a fraction of that, that's a good way to grow your network. Well, Ron Richards, uh, being a host of All About Android for some time now, we were very excited to ask you about your thoughts on Boy Genius' newest report, where you stand on Apple's iMessage being unfriendly to Android users and Google's campaign for Apple to convert to RCS. This has been going on for a while now. Consumer Intelligence Research Partners, or, or SERP, reports that between 10 and 15 of new iPhone buyers in the U.S. come from Android. Okay, so of that 10 to 15 percent, number one, prior phone problems. That's 53 of them, 53 percent of them saying, eh, we just want a new phone. Number two, new phone features. Maybe the iPhone has a better camera. 26% said that was the case. Number three, cost. I would like to spend less on a new iPhone than a comparable Android smartphone. 15% people said that. And uh, the last one, number four, community connecting, meaning iMessage and FaceTime on iOS is a draw. It, that's only 6% six, uh, 6 according to Boy Genius Report. But it's a real thing, isn't it? It is. We, we actually were talking about this on All About Android recently, and, and uh, actually Jason Howell was really trying to wrap his head around this whole concept because there was a there have been a couple of reports recently about brand affinity to Android and to Google Pixel and people jumping ship going over to iPhone. Going through those examples you put out there, I would eliminate cost because I feel like it's pretty much at parity. If, if anything, you know, a new iPhone is a, is as expensive or cost comparable to the new Samsung Android phone or to the Pixel, or whatever. I feel like we've got somewhat yeah. cost parity yeah. there. When you're the only yeah, when you're in the only X factor yeah. is whatever discounts that the carriers provide. Like sign up for Verizon, get a get a free iPhone, or, and I don't know. I'm not following those promotions, but there there could be carrier based discounts that are that are swaying people. Um, the new phone features one i mean that is just literally that's a tennis game right like android's got the better camera iphone's got the better camera like you know i you know iphone yeah. ios is pulling in features from android you know now ios has the dynamic island and all this sort of stuff like i feel like the feature arms war you know it just literally like it, that changes from release to release to release which phone is better um yeah. I do I do think the prior phone problems is a I'm not surprised to see that as such a high percentage is 50%, but I do think that the community connection and the iMessage aspect of it is is more of an issue than this is reflecting because the the whole green bubble shame is real. I mean, I've I've suffered it for years. I've dealt with I've I literally literally last week I had a friend complain it's like yeah but every time you text me you have a green bubble like it's it, it's amazing what <laughs> what culture class class war apple has created which is very ironic giving steve jobs's view of the world and stuff like that that they actually created a haves and have nots kind of scenario well, but i mean it's not so uh, yes it's a class war but it's also you know if you're on android and you're in a group text with a bunch of iMessage people the you know the the group thread breaks yeah now it, whose fault is that it's kind of apple's fault right because apple 100 percent. percent. so but, yeah ron my question is though the shaming is real so like we're that's coming from the iphone user going to the android user or hey let's throw out the flip phone user there too we don't want to yeah. leave them out either but like the the idea is maybe that shame is is not effective right like we might feel like oh we got the green you know oh i did a group chat and all of a sudden it turned green oh boy you know that like but maybe that doesn't actually correlate to a, a, much of a change in buying behavior 
for Android phone use. At least so, that's like that's what I'm. That's what the study seems to show me. It's like your your derision as an iPhone owner does not impact me that much as well, an Android. Well, user. so and I and I think this is where we get into where you question the methodology of the survey, yeah. right? Because because we you know there was I think it was the Wall Street Journal article a couple of months ago. The it is it is a real thing with kids. It is a real thing with middle school and high school kids to, to, to be the kid with an Android phone that's not in the iMessage group. That like cyber, I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but that level of cyber bullying around yeah. the color of their thing it is enough. I've it's talked real. to, I've, I've, yeah, I've talked to yeah. friends who are parents who've been like, yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to, but I had to get them an iPhone because they, they can't miss out on the thing or whatever. Like, and it's, mm-hmm. and it's something that I'm personally afraid of with my kids that I, because being an Android person, I want to be like, hey, use the Pixel. But, um, because listen, I've got a box of these reviews units that you can use right now but um. this is, we're also you know we're going through the survey where at least a few of uh, the people that were surveyed said we wanted the iphone because it was cheaper so it's not right. as if android is some like you know bargain basement uh you know, mobile system at all at yeah. this point. Well, I also I also wonder. It also depends on what people think of Android, right? And and the and I'll go back to the deals. Like I just quickly searched iPhone 14 cost, and the first link I get back is Verizon get an iPhone 14 on us, and Apple saying get 200 to 630 dollars off on an iPhone 14 when you trade in, right? Like so, there are lots of aggressive pricing deals that are happening on the Apple side. Um, Whereas on the flip side, if you're just a casual consumer and you see what's going on with Android and you see Samsung touting the latest foldable or Google touting the latest foldable and it's $2,000, is there a perceived perception there? It's like if I'm being told the the, the latest and greatest Android phone is $1,700, I can't even afford that. I'm just going to stick with the iPhone. I'm going to switch over to the iPhone, not realizing that there's actually a very robust low mid and you know flagship tiers within android and you can find a really great iphone a real iphone a really great android phone in the three to four hundred dollar range that that is on par with a lot of the you know a lot of the functionality that i that iphone does provide maybe not so much on the camera side maybe not so much on some of the the higher level processing stuff but for the the bulk of you know we talk about class war for the bulk of the middle and lower class Android is the better option from a cost standpoint, but iPhone is the one that's sought after. So, I, well, I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, yes, we could we could go on and on about this, um, yeah. but since we're all travelers, uh, we're <laughs> we like to think of ourselves <laughs> as worldly people. Um, it is travel tech on this week's Tom Top Tom's Top Five where Tom shares his picks for personal travel tech to make your trip a little bit more enjoyable. You might go Android, you might go iOS, you might, I don't know, have a uh, Palm Pilot. I don't care, but you can catch it at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. All right, well, the conventional Rhythm One pinball, you know, the classic arcade game. You use those flippers, knock silver ball around a table to score points. If this is your first time hearing about pinball, you are gonna you're gonna be amazed by this conversation. But if you've heard about it, you might think, eh, it's too old-fashioned for modern tastes. Uh, it's just a thing of the past. Well, a recent article in The Economist notes the resurgence of interest in pinball, with sales of new machines rising 15 to 20 percent every year since 2008. And that's according to Zen Sharp from Stern Pinball, the last remaining pinball maker. So, I mean, they would know where the market's at. Uh, Ron, I'm curious, uh, could you g- let us know about your your startup uh, uh, Scorebit and this kind of concept of connecting pinball machines to the internet? Can you kind of maybe break down the tech that's being integrated into, you know, we, we think of pinball machines as old tech, but there's a lot of modern tech in these things, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I'll actually start by uh, well actually you because oh. uh, th- that quote came from uh, Zach Sharp from Stern Pinball and the last remaining pinball maker is actually not accurate. There's actually a oh. bunch of pinball manufacturers that are out there, and that's part of the resurgence. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, just a quick kind of you know 
past 20 years history lesson, um, you know, pinball has been, you know, we all grew up with it. I, I got to, you know, like I played my first pinball machine in, at Comdex in 1987 when my dad took me <laughs> to it. I was like 10 years old um, and played in the in the game room at the hotel. Like pinball has been a mainstay within arcades, right? And, and what's so much fun about pinball mm -hmm. is that there's a technology aspect to it with the lights and the bells and the ding and all this other stuff. But then there's a kinetic physics piece of it in that you, you know, you're hitting the flipper to the ball, the ball's moving in a, in a trajectory. You can move the machine and change the outcome of the game, which you can't do in a video game, right? So there's a physicality to it, which makes pinball so much fun. Um, pinball hit rough times in the late 90s. Uh, Bally and Williams, who was um, the biggest manufacturer of all of them, uh, you know, kind of gravitated more to slot machines and shut down their, and video games were rampant. They were, you know, they, they were the makers of Mortal Kombat. So clearly they're making millions of Mortal Kombat and pinball was struggling, um, especially when an average pinball machine costs, you know, it can be very expensive. You know, these days pinball machines cost anywhere from seven thousand to fifteen thousand dollars per machine, right? So it's it's wow. a big investment. Yeah, it's a big investment. But um, and and whatever the rate of inflation, that's how much it cost in the nineties. It was still thousands of dollars. Um, so they shut down their pinball division, and pinball kind of was like on its last leg. Stern Pinball was the last manufacturer standing. Um, they were still making machines in the two thousands, but at a very slow rate. They put out like one or two new games a year for years and years and years. Um, but then some point around. Around, you know, around 2010 or so, things started, you know, kind of taking an upswing. More manufacturers arrived on the scene. The, the second largest pinball manufacturer, a company called Jersey Jack Pinball, um, was innovative with their first machine in that instead of, if you played pinball, a game in the 90s, you probably remember it had like a very pixel-based dot matrix screen mm -hmm. where the scores. Oh, yeah. Jersey Jack was the first manufacturer to build an OS based on Linux to run the machine and put a... 26 inch monitor on the back box and have like video animation and stuff playing. And like, so that kind of moved the technology level forward a bit. Um, and then you've seen some smaller boutique uh, manufacturers like spooky pinball and pinball brothers. And, and the, the, there's a list of them out there now. Um, Chicago gaming company, whole bunch of other companies that have emerged that are releasing one, maybe two pinball machines a year. Stern has been the one that has the real mark. They're like the Apple as much as I hate to say it of, of in terms of, in terms of market, dominance um they release anywhere from four to six games a year um uh new games and and pushing the technology forward but um pinball has has very much been a you buy the machine you plug it in you play it and that's that um mm -hmm. and so the idea of connecting it to the internet is somewhat new uh actually so scorbit is a company that i co-founded with uh jay adelson who some folks might know might remember he was the former ceo of dig and co-founder of revision three where sarah and i worked together and roger worked together mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. a along with brian o'neill who worked at dig and then uh, also worked at eventbrite and slack um I was actually living in San Francisco at the time and I was in Molotovs in the lower hate and there's two pinball machines there and I was playing it and just having a fun time not knowing what I was doing and uh, noticed that someone put up a flyer that there was a pinball league forming in the upper hate. Um, and so I went to the website and I was curious. I'm like, well, I like pinball. So I signed up and this is, must've been like 2012 so, or yeah, so. So you were like, yeah. you were like a casual pinball. Totally. Mm -hmm. drunken pinball that. playing like drunk <laughs> drunken pinball playing didn't know what to do and like the whole thing was what was that. fun was what was fun is that once you hit the ball and get multi-ball you're like oh how do i do that again and so like started talking to other people oh, playing yeah. pinball oh, and I that's when i that, yeah. that's when i discovered that there was a whole competitive aspect to it and there's actually an internet it's uh, the international flipper pinball association which is like kind of like the pga and there are tournaments all around the world and people are ranked at one point i was ranked like 700th in the world as far as competitive of pinball players my i'm now like in the 3000s because i don't play as much anymore but like this i so what you had was what happened in san francisco in cities like chicago seattle new york la you had these small pinball leagues cropping up and and competitive pinball players getting into it and it had a real cool casual kind of bar vibe to it and and um it was a lot just a lot of fun um and so you saw more for whatever reason culturally you saw this upswing of people playing pinball and that kind of mirrored the upswing of manufacturers emerging um, but nobody was doing anything with the internet. So uh, Jay and myself were at California Extreme, which is a uh, arcade game show in San Jose that happens every year. And mm -hmm. 
And I was actually saying to Jay how it would be really cool if I had an app to keep track of my scores because uh, a friend of mine that I was playing with, uh, uh, he beat me and he got a really high score on Star Trek, on a Star Trek game. And he went, oh, cool. And he took out his phone and opened up a text file and scrolled down to Star Trek and deleted his old <laughs> score and typed his new score. And I just went, oh, God damn it. There's a better way to do that. Right. And so, and so, so this is like 2014, 2015. And I'm talking to Jay. I'm like, yeah, I think I, I think, you know, it'd be cool to do an app where you can keep track of your pinball scores. And Jay at the time was getting into IOT and was like, yeah, that's, that'd be cool. But wouldn't it be cooler if we made a device that went into the pinball machine that connected it to the internet? So you didn't need to type in your score. You just, it just appeared in the app. And I was like, oh man, well, that, that's, that's just crazy. Um, and so it took us about five or so years of R and D pandemic in the middle of it that caused that, 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 that caused problems. But, um, we launched Scorbit, which is an app to help you keep track of your scores. And there's also like, you can find places to play pinball bars and things like that. But then we mm -hmm. created, uh, the product that I named, uh, the Scorbitron, uh, <laughs> which is a little board that goes inside a pinball machine and it literally connects it to the internet and allows you to feed your scores to the app and, and have it more, you know, go into the cloud. And it also unlocked a whole bunch of different things like uh, people who own pinball machines and put them on location. So like they, they're called operators. So when you go to a bar and play a pinball machine, uh, that owner doesn't actually, the owner of the bar doesn't own that pinball machine. There's somebody else who brings it in and they, they split the quarters, like that sort of thing. Um, but now with our device, we have ways to allow that owner to see what's going on with their machine without physically being there. All the perks of actually a modern internet com connected device. So we launched Scorbit. It's been, uh, been going great. Um, uh, a couple of years after we launched Stern Pinball, launched their own platform uh, called Stern Insider Connected, um, hmm. which has it's a nice lot of similar. It's nice to be nice to be recognized and copied. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, I, I will. My, I will. <laughs> I will bite my tongue on any commentary there. No, honestly, they've done a great job, and it's a lot of fun to use, and it's great. Um, the the caveat with their with their product is that it only works with their their ultra modern machines. So it all so Stern has made you know hundreds of machines over the years um their platform only works with the latest and greatest so it only works on like 18 games total so whereas scorbit works on over 500 games like it works scorbit works on every pinball machine from modern machines all the way back to the 70s like solid state machines in the 70s wow. um yeah so you but know, uh I, yeah. I have to ask you ron i mean i i think you probably get this all the time people saying yeah. oh so like vinyl it's a nostalgia thing Yep. Right. You want to, you know, bring bring something, you know, maybe back to, you know, people uh, out and about, but uh, with a modern twist. Yep. But how do you reconcile with the fact that they have to go somewhere? Well, I think it's well, I think it's great because it promotes getting out of the house and being social. Right. Like for yeah. me, every Wednesday night I had pinball league and I went and played with 80 other people and I made new friends and it was this whole community. Um, you know, I, I there's and again, it's that physicality of it. There's you know, it's one thing to sit on the couch and plug in an Xbox Live or PlayStation, whatever it is, and play with somebody in Australia. That's really cool for a specific thing. But there's something else about going to a bar and like putting in a bunch of quarters and having four people play a four player game and have it all be there and cheer each other on and that sort of thing. It, it really was like energizing and fun. So like it, I, it's, I see the nostalgia piece because it, it is a nostalgic thing. You know, the you know, happy days with, the, with Fonzie and the pinball machine, <laughs> but the machines yeah. that are coming out now are, they've got full motion video. Um, now they've got these internet connected, you know, kind of aspect of it to it, which not only allow you to keep track of your scores, but unlocks like achievements um, and, and uh, virtual tournaments and score bit. We have a way where uh, Sarah, I can play a game here in New York and challenge you and you can play me wherever you are on the same game and see who gets the, a better score right and so it, it just it's 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 just a really cool thing to do i mean it's it's a game that yes has a nostalgic aspect but to me has never lost any of its interest you know mm -hmm. any of its interesting aspect it's not like we're playing this old timey thing and it doesn't work like you look at a game that just came out like uh, the latest game that just came out from stern um is called is based on foo fighters Right. So it's got all the music oh, wow. of the Foo Fighters. It's got great animation. Uh, you know, the, the guy who designed it, Jack Danger, is a friend of mine and it's got a great design and it's just a ton of fun to play. And now the much like when a new game comes out for PlayStation 5, there's a lot of excitement in the community as who played the new game, who's going to get it and all that sort of stuff. 
it's very expensive. It's like 13 grand to get that machine. <laughs> but, um, yeah. um, but people, but people do collect machines. I mean, I have three machines in my garage. Like it's, it's, it's a way to, you know, keep practicing. And then, then, you know, like I may go into Brooklyn and play a tournament next weekend and, and meet up with, you know, 40 other people who want to play pinball. And it just, it's, it's a social element to it, which I think makes it really special. Oh. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Well, thanks so much for telling us more sure. about um, more, more about the effort and, you know, thanks for bringing, uh, nostalgia into the modern world. Yeah. And go to, go to scorebit.io. You can see it all on our website and we're in, um, we have a, the app is available on iOS and Android, of course, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's all about having fun. That's the point of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, you're also doing a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. Where can we send people, uh, if they, if they loved hearing you, uh, where can they where, check out your, your podcast work as well? Exactly. So every Tuesday over, over our friends over at Twit, I do all about Android, uh, which is a podcast dedicated to the world of Android. And that's, uh, with Jason Howell and Huynh Dow and Michelle Rahman and J.R. Raphael. And we got a great crew over there doing it. Florence Ion comes on the show. Um, and yeah, every Tuesday, about an hour and a half of, of Android news and reviews and hardware and all that fun stuff. Um, so you can get that, subscribe to that podcast, please. Uh, you can follow me over on Instagram and on Twitter at RonXO. That's my handle. Uh, and every now and then I pop up on iFanboy, my old comic book podcast where I talk about movies and TV shows and stuff like that. You can hear me over That's there. That's where I, I, I first met you. Yeah, when still you going strong. In the still going, fanboy yeah. days. Yeah. Yep, still yeah. going strong. Yeah. Speaking so. of nostalgia, well, Ron, so, so, so glad to have you with us. Um, I know the last time you were on the show was, would you say, eight years ago? Um, eight years ago. So, 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 so 2031, yeah. I'll be on. Yeah, we'll, so, we'll yeah. see you back then. <laughs> we got you on the books. We're not. <laughs> Let's not make it another eight years. Um, but, uh, but, but really good to have you. And thanks for telling us all about uh, Scorbit and, and your stuff. Uh, but yeah. just a reminder, patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. It is Friday in the U.S., Sometimes we do quizzes, but today it's a Proust questionnaire. Mm -hmm. uh, but just a reminder, you can catch a show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're going to be back Monday. It is WWDC Day, and Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines from the Snob OS podcast will join us then. Have a great weekend. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host producer and writer Tom Merritt. Host producer and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Trofolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterdeen. Our mods, Beatmaster, W Scottus One, BioCow, Cap Dipper, Steve Guadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, aka Gadget Virtuoso, and JD Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Gustafa A, Acast, and Lynn Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Contributors for this week's shows include Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Guests on this week's show included Ron Richards. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>